And so I just want to take a moment to acknowledge how connected the work we're doing at these two new spaces is to our clients. And that's why I'm so thrilled to have this time today to talk about the criminal justice system and to talk to three amazing advocates for a better future. The f I'll introduce them quickly. Um, Piper Kerman is an incredible, <laughs> incredible advocate. Her best-selling and award-winning memoir, Orange is the New Black, became a Netflix TV series and introduced issues of criminal justice to a brand new audience and continues to shape the discussion. She's also a tireless advocate for prison reform, for criminal justice reform, for reentry, for issues affecting women in prison. And we're so thrilled to have her with us today. She's a longtime friend of EJI and has received our Champion of Justice Award. Our next panelist that I will introduce briefly is a legend in criminal defense. He has argued and won four cases before the US Supreme Court. He's one of the most recognized capital and trial defense attorneys in America. He founded the Southern Center for Human Rights in 1982. He's taught at Yale Law School since 1993. He is the person who convinced me to stay in law school and choose the career that I've chosen. So he holds a special place in my heart He's a long, long friend of EJI. Uh, the incredible, incomparable Stephen Bright is here today. <laughs> and finally, um, when I first arrived at EJI 10 years ago, one of the first cases I worked on was that of a man named Anthony Ray Hinton, who at that time had been incarcerated on death row in Alabama for over 20 years, despite being innocent of the two murders for which he'd been convicted. EJI spent 16 years, led by Brian Stevenson, fighting for his release. He was finally released in 2015 after the United States Supreme Court, in a unanimous 9-0 opinion, recognized that his lawyer was constitutionally ineffective and set the stage for a new trial. Since he has been released, <clears throat> after spending 30 years on Alabama's death row for crimes he did not commit, Mr. Hinton has become one of the most profound voices for reform in the system and for the end of the death penalty. There is simply nobody else like him, and we are so thrilled to have him here today. So please welcome to the stage Anthony Ray Hinton, Piper Kerman, and Steve Bright. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, if Jelani Cobb was the luckiest man in town yesterday <coughs> to be up here with Michelle Alexander and Sherilyn Eiffel, then I am the luckiest lady in town today because I am up here with two very wonderful men, right? So uh, Professor Steve Bright has tried capital cases before juries in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. And he has argued and won four capital cases before the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> Steve led the Southern Center for Human Rights for 35 years, and he is now professor of practice at the Georgia State College of Law. And he also teaches at the law schools at Yale and Georgetown. How do you find the time? <laughs> uh, Steve received the American Bar Association's Third Good Marshall Award, along with many, many other recognitions of his work. I'm glad you're here, Steve. And uh, Anthony Ray Hinton is the author of The Sun Does Shine. Yeah. Yeah. 
subtitled, How I Found Life and Freedom on Death Row. He was falsely convicted of murder in Birmingham, Alabama, sentenced to death, and spent 28 years on death row despite his innocence. In April 2015, Brian Stevenson and EJI helped Anthony to win his freedom. And uh, it took 16 years because the state of Alabama did everything in their power to keep him on death row. So, uh, Ray, your story is riveting and your book is wonderful. Thank I, you. If you haven't read the book, which, <laughs> yeah. The book was just published last month. You need to rent out and get a copy. And I'll tell you something, chapters 13, 14, and 15 <laughs> are instructive of how we all can live our lives, I think. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is so important and illuminating about your story and about the book and the book as a, as a vehicle for that story is that it is such a clear example of what Brian talks about when he points out the fact that our criminal justice system will treat a person who is guilty and wealthy far better than a person who is innocent but is poor, right? And uh, Ray, I just hope that perhaps you'd just tell us a little bit more about that journey and that story oh, so absolutely. that everyone can know. Let me stand up. Sure. First, I am here today because of some people, I call them my family, I call them justice seekers. At this moment, I would like for all of my EJI family to stand up. I can't say enough about I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. But 30 years ago, the state of Alabama came to my mother home. I was in the backyard cutting grass, didn't want to be cutting grass. And I ran into a lot of you, and, and in Alabama in July, it is beyond hot. But my mother asked me, are you going to revival tonight? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, what time does revival start? And I said, seven o'clock, mama. She said, well, you got time to go out there and cut that grass. <laughs> and I gave my mother this baby look, but today, for whatever reason, it wasn't working. I looked at my mother and I said, mama, I promise you, I will cut that grass tomorrow. My mother looked at me and she said, I'm trying my best to see how did you get you'll cut the grass tomorrow out of me telling you to go cut the grass. <laughs> and with that, she gave me this look that only I knew what it meant and she finally said, boy, get out there and cut that grass. And I goes outside and I began to cut the grass and about 20 and 25 minutes into cutting the grass, I just happened to look up. And there stood two white gentlemen. I cut the lawnmower off and I said, can I help you? They said, yes, we're looking for Anthony Ray Henson. I said, that would be me again, how can I help you? They identified themselves as two detectives from the Birmingham Police Department. I said, again, how can I help you? They said, we have a warrant for your arrest. I said, for what? They said, we will explain that to you later, but right now we want you to put your hands behind your back. I complied, I put my hands behind my back. They put the handcuff on me and proceeded to put me in the squad car and I said, hold up, at least allow me the opportunity to go in and tell my mother that I'm being arrested for something. One of the detectives said, we can't let you go back inside and we argued for about two minutes and finally the other detective said, let him go in and tell his mother that he's being arrested. I goes in and I don't say a word to my mother. I just show her the handcuffing like any good mother. 
She began to scream and holler, what are those handcuffs doing on my baby? The detective said, take him outside while I stand here and talk to his mother. A few minutes later, the detective come out and we proceeded to go to the county jail. The detective turned around and said, Anthony, do you own a firearm? I said, no, I do not. He said, do your mother own a firearm? And I said, yes. And I told him what kind it was. And every day in this state of Alabama, somebody come up to me and say, why did you tell the police about a gun that they had no knowledge of? And I said, all my life, my mother told me, if you haven't done anything, why are you lying? If you haven't done anything, why are you running? Always just tell the truth. And that day, I told the truth. They dropped me off at a substation, turned around and went back to my mother's house and somehow talked to her and she gave them the pistol. They come back and they picked me up. Once again, we proceeded to go to the county jail. The detective wouldn't say a word and I asked him at least 50 times, detective, why am I being arrested? Never would respond. And as they drove a little farther for the 51st time, I said, detective, if you don't mind, tell me why are y'all arresting me? And he finally turned around and he looked at me and he said, you want to know why we arrested you? I said, yes. He said, we're going to charge you with first degree robbery, first degree kidnap, first degree attempted murder. I said, I haven't done any of that. You got the wrong person. He said, let me tell you something right now. I don't care whether you did it or didn't do it, but I'm going to make sure you're found guilty of it. I said, for a crime that I didn't commit, he said, you must have a hidden problem. Didn't I just tell you I don't care whether you did it or didn't do it? And as we drove a little farther, he turned around and looked at me and he said, by the way, there's five things that are going to convict you. Would you like to know what they are? And I said, yes. He said, number one, you're black. Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him. Whether you shot him or not, he said, believe me if you believe nothing else. I don't care. He said, number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, you're going to have a white judge. And number five, you're going to have an all-white jury. He said, do you know what that spell? And he repeated the word conviction, 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 conviction. And as we got to the county jail, they put me in this holding cell for about two and a half hours and finally he come back and I said, detective, if you don't mind, tell me the date and the time this crime took place. He goes through his note and he looks and he tell me the date and the time and I said, thank God. I said, detective, I was at work that particular day and that particular time and I said, thank you, Jesus, my supervisor happened to be white. I gave him my supervisor address. I gave him his phone number. I said, you can go out there and check. And about four and a half hours later, he come back. He said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we no longer going to charge you with first degree robbery, first degree kidnap, first degree attempted murder. He said, your alibi checks out. He said, but now the bad news. We have decided that we're going to charge you now with two counts of first degree capital murder. I said, but I haven't killed anyone. He said, you really need to get that hidden problem fixed because on the way here, I told you, I don't care whether you did it or didn't do it. He said, and it's still the same here. I don't care. And as I was talking to the detective, somehow I was able to make him see me as an individual. And he looked at me, he said, and by the way, I truly believe that you didn't do it. He said, but y'all, referring to all black, he said, y'all is always taking up on one another. Take this rep for your homeboy. With tears coming down my cheeks, I said, detective, I don't have enough. I don't have a homeboy in this world that I would take a rap like this for. I sit in jail, I go before a judge, and the judge asks me, do I understand the charges that I'm being charged with? And I tell him yes. He asks me, do I have an attorney? And I tell him no. He said, the state of Alabama would appoint you one. Mm -hmm. 
He looks back in his courtroom and he calls his lawyer up front. Without even asking me my name, the lawyer looked at me and he said, I didn't go to law school to do pro bono work. I looked at the lawyer and I said, would it make a difference to you if I told you that I was innocent? The lawyer looked at me and he said, the problem with that statement, all of y'all is always doing something and then saying you didn't do it. This is the lawyer that I had to believe that will represent me. I sit in jail for a year and a half. They tried me, convict me. The judge, for whatever reason, stood up that day. Say, Anthony Ray Hinton, you have been found guilty of two counts of first degree capital murder. It is the order of this court that I sentence you to die. And that judge had the audacity to say, may God have mercy on your soul. The prosecution ran out that day and told the media that the state of Alabama got the worst killer off the street that day, but only it wasn't true. And on December the 16th, 17, 1986, I was transported to Holman Correction Facility where they housed death row inmates. And for the next three years, I didn't say a word to another human being. I went into this dark place and I realized today that this dark place that I was able to go in is what really saved my life. But early going into the fourth year, I woke up <clears throat> to the sound of a grown man crying, a man that I lived by for three years. Never asked him his name or where he was from. But approximately about 1 a.m. in the morning, I heard this man crying. My mother have always taught me compassion. My mother said no matter what one does in life, he or she still deserves compassion. And it was that compassion that came out of me that made me holler through this brick wall and I said, hey, there's something wrong over there. Took this gentleman a while to respond, but finally he said, I just got worried my mother passed. I told him that I was sorry to hear this. And I told him that if anybody was going to argue his case, it would be his mother. And she would argue his case before God. And I told him a little corny jokes. I often tell people I was born with two things, if nothing else, in this world. I was born to a mother who loved me. And I was born with a sense of humor. You know, there's some beautiful ladies here, but I don't care how beautiful you are, and whether you're old, young, I'm the type of old country boy that if I see you walking and you just happen to fall, I will be the first one to run to you and help you up, and I'm going to be the first one to ask you, are you okay? But the moment you tell me you're fine, I'm going to laugh at you for falling. <laughs> I have always believed that laughter is good for the soul. And so that day, me and this man, I told him a corny joke and we laughed and I laid back down and about six o'clock that morning I woke up and I realized that my voice was back and my sense of humor was back and the state of Alabama was in the process of executing four men that were finna kill the third man and I called this guard up to my cell and I said, officer, is there anything you can give me? Well, I won't have to smell the human flesh burning. The guard looked at me and he said, no, there's nothing I can give you. But if there's a consolation into it, he said, you'll get used to it. <laughs> and then he said something profound. He said, and by the way, one day somebody will smell your flesh burning. And as he said that, he walked away. I sit on this bunk that really was too small for me. And I told my mind that I had to leave. I had to somehow escape in order to survive this place. I looked at my body and I told my body that the mind had to leave and it was as though my body looked up at me and said, do you promise to come back? And I said, yes. I said, I got to come back and check on this case anyway. And as soon as my body gave me permission, permission to leave, I left. And of all the places in the world to go, 
I wanted to go see Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> In my mind, I shows up at the palace. I tell the guard to tell the queen that I was there to see her. I goes in and the queen and I have this conversation about Prince Charles, Prince William, Prince Harry, and of course the tragedy of Lady Prince died. And finally the queen realized that she hadn't offered me anything to drink and she looks at me and she said, Mr. Hitton, <laughs> would you like some tea? And I told the queen I would love some tea. And she said, what would you like in your tea? And I told her a spot of lemon. She tell the butler to go out and bring me this lemon and I squeeze it, put it in my tea. We drink, we talk, and I finally stand up and tell the queen that I must be living. I leave and now that I realize that I can leave prison in my mind whenever I wanted to and what nothing nobody could do about it, I did something that I said as a young boy that I would never do. I said at the age of 12 that I would never get married. But then I decided that I would marry the beautiful and talented actress, Halle Berry. <laughs> Halle Berry and I stayed married for 15 long years up here in this month. <laughs> Halle Berry was what I call, if there's a thing, I've never been married. Harry Bailey was called the perfect wife. She never did complain. She never did do anything but say, yes, dear, and okay, dear. And what I loved about Hattie more than anything, she didn't spend any money. <laughs> and then going into the 16 year, the prison did something for death row inmate that they never do. The prison decided that they would show us a movie, and the movie was Speed. For the first time in my life, I see Sandra Bullock. In my mind, I'm imagining Halle looking at Sandra Bullock and enjoying the movie as I'm enjoying the movie. Now I'm thinking, I'm watching this woman drive this bus. I look at Halle and I look at Sandra Bullock. I look at Sandra Bullock and I look at Halle. I'm trying to build my nerves up to tell Halle some bad news. <laughs> In my mind, I'm trying to get the nerves up to tell Hallie that I'm going to divorce her <laughs> and I'm going to marry Sandra Bull. In my mind, I'm thinking if a woman can drive a bus this good, imagine what she could do with a good getaway car. <laughs> and then the guard was there calling me. The guard said, Anthony, I've been calling you for 10 minutes. I said, I've been gone, what is it? He said, you have a legal visit. I said, but I don't have an attorney. He said, Anthony, if somebody's out there pretending to be a lawyer, get up and go see who it is. I get dressed, I go out there, and there's this lawyer from Boston. The lawyer introduced himself. I said, who sent you from Boston? He tells me a man by the name of Brian Stevenson or EJI. I said, who is Brian Stevenson and who is EJI? He tells me the work that they do at EJI and how good, but he used the word great, how great Brian Stevenson was. And I listened at him and I said, you've been telling me about this Brian Stevenson and how great he is. I said, but he can't be that great because Brian Stevenson have already made one fundamental mistake. And he looked at me and he said, what is that mistake? I said, had Brian Stevenson got in touch with me before he sent you here, Brian Stevenson would have known that I am a beloved Yankee fan. And there's no way a Yankee fan and a Boston fan could ever work together. I said, but for your sake, I'm willing to put my personal feeling aside and let you work on my case. And then for three years, this lawyer worked on my case and he would come back and tell me what he was trying to do. And then in the fourth year, he came back, he said, Anthony, I think I can get you a life without parole. Mm. I said, get who a life without parole? He said, you. I said, life without parole is for guilty people, not innocent people. I said, I would prefer to die than to stand up and say I did something when I didn't do it. 
I said, I don't know whether you'll be able to understand what I'm about to tell you. I said, but I was 12 years old and my mother called me in her room and she said, I want to tell you something. She said, if you man enough to bend down and pick up a rock, and if you man enough to throw that rock, you should be man enough to say you throw that rock. I said, this is one rock I didn't throw. Therefore, I could never say I did this when I didn't. I said, if the state of Alabama is hell bent on executing me for something that they knew that I didn't do, so be it. I said, all of us had to die at some point in some time. I'm not ready to die, and I definitely don't want to die for something that I didn't do, but if that's the way it be, so be it. I looked at this lawyer, and I said, I need a lawyer that believes in me. I need a lawyer that is willing to go to jail for me if necessary, the fact that you're trying to get me a life without parole tells me you don't believe in me. And today I have no choice but to fire you. The lawyer said, are you serious? I said, yes. And as he's going out the front door, I'm going in the back, something in my mind said, you got to be the dumbest person in the world. <laughs> you just fired the only lawyer that you had. And just as that thought came to my mind, another thought came and said, always stand up for what you believe in. Always stand up for principle. And, and as I get back to my cell, the guard is watching TV, and I stop and I ask him, what are you watching? He tell me, this attorney out of Montgomery, a lawyer by the name of Brian Stevenson. I said, you mind if I stand here and listen at him a moment? He said, sure. I listened at Brian Stevenson, and he was talking about why we don't need a death penalty in this country. For whatever reason, I can't tell you the exact reason, but I knew at that moment, this is the man that I needed to represent me. That night, I wrote Mr. Stevenson a letter thanking him for the lawyer from Boston. I told Mr. Stevenson that I would like for him to consider becoming my lawyer. I said, but before you say yes or no, all I ask is that you read my transcript. I said, if you find one thing in my transcript that points to my guilt, do not worry about becoming my lawyer. Do not send me another lawyer. I am prepared to die for something that I know and God knows that I didn't do. I get a reply from Mr. Stevenson about three months later. He tells me he will read my transcript. Five months later, I get a letter saying that he would be coming down to see me. I cannot explain it, but the moment I shook this man's hand, I knew God had sent me his best lawyer. We sit there. We sit there and we talked about our childhood. And finally, I looked at Mr. Stevenson and I said, Mr. Stevenson, the state of Alabama is saying the gun they got from my mother's house is the murder weapon. I said, Mr. Stevenson, there's no two guns alike. I already know that the state of Alabama is lying. I said, Mr. Stevenson, I need you to do me a favor. But Stevenson looked at me and he said, what is the favor? I said, I need you to hire a qualified ballistic expert. I said, my case revolved around ballistic and ballistics only. But Stevenson looked at me and in a nice amount of way, the way he talked, he said, well, I was going to do that anyway. <laughs> and I looked at Mr. Stevenson and I said, Mr. Stevenson, I'm not explaining myself right. Mr. Stevenson, I need you to hire a white man. I need this white man to be from the South. I need this white man to believe in the death penalty. I need this white man to be the best of the best. But above all of that, I need this white man to tell the truth. Mr. Stevenson looked at me and he said, I will try my best. He said, but I need to ask you something. Why do he have to be white? I said, Mr. Stevenson, I lived in the South all of my life. And one thing I know about the South, they only recognize one of their own. I said, Mr. Stevenson, you can go out and get the best white female in the country. Her word is no good upon that witness stand in the South. And Mr. Stevenson, you know it cannot be a person of color. He left about three months later. The guard tells me to call Mr. Stevenson. 
I call Mr. Stevenson. He tells me that he found three of the world-renowned noun experts. He said, two of them live in Texas and one of them live in Virginia. I said, they don't get no Southern in Texas and Virginia. <laughs> he said, but Ray, I need to tell you something. These three experts are the best. They are better than good. He said, but I need to inform you that they have never testified for the defense. Ray, they testify all the time for the prosecution. He said, are you sure these are the men that you want me to hire? He said, in other words, 98% of their testimony have been for the prosecution. I said, Mr. Stevenson, did you remember to ask them would they just tell the truth? And he said, yes. They all said they would tell exactly what the evidence says. I said, Mr. Stevenson, if you can afford it, hire those three experts. They came to Alabama on separate occasions, and at the end of it, they did something that I had never heard of. They tried to make the gun match, and it still wouldn't match. We take this new evidence now to the Attorney General by the name of Bill Pryor, and Bill Pryor was quoted as saying it would be a waste of the taxpayer money to take one hour to re-examine those bullets, and it would be a waste of my time. And for not doing his job as an attorney general, George W. Bush appointed him to a federal lifetime appointment. We go before the next attorney general by a man by the name of Troy King, and he refused. He lost in the next election. And then we came up against a man by the name of Luther Strain, and he too refused to do the right thing. And for not doing his job, he took Jeff Sessions' seat as the Senate. Then one day, Mr. Stevenson came to the prison and said, Ray, the judges in Alabama is not going to do the right thing. He said, I need your permission to take your case to the United States Supreme Court. He said, but I need to explain to you, if they rule against you, the state of Alabama will kill you within two years. I had lost my mother, and at that point in time, I really didn't care. I looked at Mr. Stevenson, and I said, fine, my case to the United States Supreme Court. They filed the case, and two years later, the United States Supreme Court did something in my case that it had never done in the history of the court. All nine judges ruled that I was entitled to a new trial. Mm -hmm. And to this day... They send the case back to Alabama. We go to Birmingham. The prosecution stand up and tell the judge, Your Honor, it is with great sadness that we have to inform the court that EJI have stolen the gun in question. Uh, they put it more likely they forgot to return it. And then EJI is the top of the line. They hand the judge the paperwork showing that they had turned the gun back over. The judge gives them time to find the gun, and a few months later, they find the gun, and they come back to the courtroom and say, Your Honor, we found the gun, but it was great sadness that we informed the court we have lost the bullets that goes to the gun. All of this time, I'm still sitting in jail, and finally, the, the prosecution asked one of his own experts that testified 30 years ago to come back and re-examine the bullets he comes back and he examines the bullets and he tells the prosecution the bullets do not match the way they matched 30 years ago. Mm. But the bullets match exactly 30 years ago, the same that they did 30 years later. My life was not worth them telling the truth. And then through electronic, they notified the judge that they was dropping all charges against me. Thirty years of pure hell. Thirty years because I was born black. Thirty years because I didn't have the money to hire 
a lawyer. If that's what you want for justice. I come to Montgomery today to ask you one of the most profound questions. The state of Alabama was seeking justice, the highest justice they could. They wanted to execute me. And they was going to do it in your name. And they was calling it justice. I want someone to stand up and tell me where is my justice? To this day, nobody in the governor office or the attorney general office or nowhere have had the decency to say, Mr. Hinton, we're sorry. I've tried my best to believe that they haven't said they're sorry because I'm, I'm black. But every night I wrestle with this question. Why I haven't gotten an apology? You took 30 years from me. You knew from day one that those bullets was not the bullets, and here I am three years later, the state of Alabama have yet to apologize. And tonight I leave you with this question. What would you do if they came for you? What would you do if you was charged with a crime you didn't commit? What would you do if you didn't have the money to hire a decent defense? What would you do if the system looked at you for the color of your skin than the merits of the case? What would you do if you was found guilty? What would you do if you took a polygraph test and no one believed you? What would you do if you had to spend the rest of your life on a cell the size of a bathroom, what would you do if you've been waiting all your life to die? How would you survive? What would you do after 30 years they finally set you free? Who would you be? Answer those questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank it's an act of profound generosity. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you. And, uh, and yeah, your story is instructive of what kindness and humor will do to carry you through the most unimaginable circumstances. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Professor Bright, Steve. Yes, Piper. Hi. You helped. Uh, you helped train Brian Stevenson so that he would be ready when the call came to free people like Ray, which is an amazing, uh, an amazing reality. Can you share with us some of the, you know, the, the legal and the policy points that help us understand yeah. how such a travesty of justice can transpire uh, in this day and age? Though, of course, all of you who have been experiencing both the museum and the memorial know how we got here, right? Thank you, Piper. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, I teach at law school, and I want law students to understand what the reality is of uh, criminal justice in our country today. 
and you cannot improve upon having Ray Hinton talk to your law school students and tell them about his case and what happened all the way through the process. He came to Yale and he filled up the auditorium at Yale uh, with undergraduates and law students and I was just a few months after he had been released uh, and it moved them as it moved you. And there's several lessons I just talk about real quickly about this. First of all, uh, we've learned from doing this work over 40 years that the criminal justice system is the part of American society that's been least affected by the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. I go around the country in the deep south in the years that I've been here and things have improved on school boards and in the legislature and uh, other places, city councils, uh, not to where they should be, but certainly different. But I go to courtrooms, like the courtroom where Ray Hinton was tried. And I look ahead and the jury's all white, the prosecutor's white, the court-appointed lawyers are white. The only person of color in the front of the courtroom is the person on trial. And this is often in communities that have populations of 30, 40 percent African American in many of the places where I am. George Kendall and I once took the case of William Anthony Brooks about 1979. He was convicted and sentenced to death by an all-white jury in Columbus, Georgia. And when we were reading the transcript of that trial, we could tell from the cold transcript by the way the jurors were treated by the prosecutor and by the judge, which jurors were white and which jurors were black. The black jurors who knew anything about the case, and everybody knew about the case, it was very highly publicized, they would be led by the prosecutor and the judge to say, the white jurors, to say they could be fair and impartial and the judge would keep them on. But then there were other jurors who would be asked about it and they were led to say, well, they probably couldn't be fair given what they know. And it's fairly easy to ask leading questions and elicit those answers. And we guessed that maybe the ones who were being led to say they couldn't be fair were African-Americans. And we picked every African-American without knowing anything but a cold transcript, nothing but a typewritten page. We could tell everyone, and the ones that weren't excluded that way, of course, the prosecutor used their discretionary strikes so that in a community, 30% African-American, William was tried by an all-white jury. He had two terrible court-appointed lawyers. Uh, the judge who presided was a man named John Henry Land. And George and I said, after we looked at the transcript and analyzed that case, he said, this was, this was a legal lynching. That was what jumped out at us. A and then we found out a number of years later that John Henry Land's father, Brewster Land, had actually participated in two lynchings in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, he had actually once helped break a man out of the courtroom and take him out to the end of the trolley line and lynch him. Uh, so Judge Land grew up, and this was not a secret. I mean, it was on the front page of the Columbus newspaper when these lynchings happened. So you see the relationship there, which I think is what the museum is showing, the relationship from slavery to mass incarceration. The other thing is that I want to point out is that 80% of all the death sentences in this country are in the states of the old Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Before the Civil War, Michigan, two other states in the North had already abolished the death penalty. Others were limiting the death penalty to just murder cases and no other, but in the South, where you had a captive population, where you had slaves and putting them in prison was really not a punishment. They were already in prison. So having the death penalty was for, even for things like passing out leaflets, was a capital offense in the southern states. Well, because we're worried about slave rebellion uh, and, and, and so forth. And there's also something the historian Dan Carter points this out in his great book about Scottsboro, the Scottsboro case here in Alabama that when the South started getting a bad press for all the lynchings, they realized that you could move it into the courthouse and you could try a case to an all-white jury with a presiding judge who was going to be uh, as a part of the prosecution team, really, and incompetent court-appointed lawyers, and you could accomplish the same thing but without having it in the courthouse lawn or on the front steps uh, of the courthouse, but you accomplish the same thing. You see cases where they would say to the mob, just let the system take its course. What that meant is to give the guy a one-day trial, find him guilty. One case in Kentucky, they actually executed the guy after an hour-long trial right out behind the courthouse. Mm. And the Courier Journal, the newspaper in Louisville, wrote an editorial and said, well, it was all short. Uh, it didn't seem very fair, uh, but at least it wasn't a lynching. 
this was an improvement over lynchings. So we see this relationship, so that's why tracing this from slavery through lynching, convict leasing, Jim Crow, and all the way to mass incarceration is so important. And the other point I just want to make, it's so critical, the major consequence of being poor in this system is having a court-appointed lawyer. And in Alabama, which doesn't have a public defender system, maybe in a few places, Birmingham here in Montgomery, but not many places, the court-appointed lawyers, such as the one Mr. Hinton got, are often people don't even specialize in criminal law, let alone in capital punishment law. Uh, and very often are people who are taking a large volume of cases, spending very little time on any case. Sometimes the lawyers are as racist as everybody else in the system, sometimes overtly so, sometimes maybe subconsciously. Uh, but that is so much a factor in who gets the death penalty and who doesn't. I wrote a piece a while back that said the death penalty not for committing the worst crime, but for the misfortune of being assigned the worst lawyer. Uh, and this case is an example of that. And there are many other, William Brooks's case when it was an example of that. And so many of the cases that I've had, three cases in Georgia where the court appointed lawyer referred to their client by a racial slur before the jury. Told the jury, uh, George Dungy's lawyer said he's a little 138 pound nigger man. That's what his own lawyer called him in closing argument. In Houston, Texas, there have been three lawyers who slept during capital trials, court-appointed mm. lawyers who could not even stay awake during their client's trial. That sort of gives you a new sense of, of, of what it means to have the dream team, uh, <laughs> particularly if you're poor. Um, but these are systemic problems, and of course, the availability of Brian Stevenson to come to the rescue here. Mm. was because not of any state program that provides lawyers for the appellate process, but because of an independent, nonprofit, public interest, legal project here, the Equal Justice Initiative, which could take the case and do the work and get the experts and bring about the exoneration of Mr. Henry. <laughs> Steve, thanks. Um, and look, can I just say, and yeah. one other thing I would just say <laughs> is that for many people, there is nobody to represent them at that stage. Yeah. You're not entitled to a lawyer at that stage. You've got to have HAI or the Southern Center for Human Rights or the Legal Defense Fund at NAACP, Legal Defense and Education Fund. You have to have a lawyer like that, but if you don't, and we've had over 100 cases now where in death penalty cases, the lawyers miss the deadline for filing. And what that means is there's no review at all. That means if you're Anthony Hinton, Anthony Ray Hinton, and your lawyer doesn't file within the deadline, you get no review by the courts whatsoever. You get executed. You, you, you think that couldn't be the case. My students have a hard time believing that. But by the end of the course, they realize that very many people we put to death in this country have had abysmally poor lawyers at trial, even worse lawyers on appeal, and have often had lawyers who couldn't even file their papers on time during the review process. And that's the lot of criminal justice for poor people in this country today, in many, many places, many cases. Yeah. And Thank the you. brutal reality is that people convicted of capital crimes have more access to counsel than pe people who are convicted for more, for the, you know, the vast majority of other things that people end up incarcerated for, right? So um, that access to, to any kind of capital defense or capital appeal is, is m more unusual for, incarcerated people. So we're, we're talking about harsh punishment here. Harsh, harsh punishment. And for those of you who have been able to get up to the memorial already and to be uh, drawn in at the museum, um, you understand the history of harsh punishment in this country that it is irrevocably you know, grown out of the soil of chattel slavery and also the forced removal of indigenous people as well, uh, and that harsh punishment was absolutely essential to maintaining those systems, those economic and cultural systems. But you know, it's important, I think, to point out that harsh punishment doesn't only apply to these capital cases. It doesn't only apply to the death penalty. It doesn't only apply to things like juvenile life without parole. We are the only nation in the world that sentences children to die in prison. 
there are more ordinary and everyday ways that we see harsh punishment playing out in the community, right? Every single day. Absolutely, yeah. I wanna tell you all a little bit about Ramona Brandt. Ramona Brandt, yeah. Ramona Brandt is a woman who was incarcerated in the same prison where I was incarcerated. And Ramona was convicted of a crime remarkably similar to my crime of conviction. She was convicted for the first time. She'd never been convicted of a crime before, like me. It was a drug offense, very much like my own drug offense. And, uh, you know, it was a drug offense that grew out of a relationship that she was in. You know, she had a boyfriend, I had a girlfriend. Uh, unlike me, Ramona, Ramona Brandt was in a relationship that was dangerous to leave. Right? I was able to safely and successfully leave that relationship. Ramona was not. I didn't meet Ramona Brandt when we were incarcerated in the same prison, though, because I was serving a 15-month sentence in the minimum security section of the prison, and Ramona Brandt had received a life sentence. So she was held in a different section of the prison. I met Ramona Brandt at the White House because Ramona Brandt was one of a very small number of people who received a commutation of her sentence. And I met her on that day. She had just been freed in February and, uh, of 20, 2016. And she had had lunch with the president along with several of the other people who had received commutations. She was a remarkable, remarkable woman. And I wish that she was here on stage today with us, but she's not because she passed away in February of this year. She had two precious years of freedom after serving 20 years in prison of that life sentence. And I think the point, you know, I think that when we look at women and girls in the criminal justice system, we see these very ordinary and everyday examples of harsh punishment in this country. It's not just restricted to the death penalty. It's not just restricted, restricted to things like juvenile life without parole. Every day in our community, you know, some of the most vulnerable people are being targeted by this harsh punishment. This is the, this is the society that we've sustained over so many hundreds of years. And this is what it is for us to change, right? So I want it, we're gonna talk a little bit about reform here uh, and what it's gonna take to make sure that, you know, that Ray or Ramona, that we never see people treated that way again in our community. So, um, gentlemen, uh, Professor Bright, maybe you wanna comment just quickly on some of those policy and practice levers that we might think about when we think about these kinds of either you know, wrongful convictions or completely inappropriate sentences? Well, you were saying that, talking about severe punishments. I was thinking of Mr. Robert Caston, who's sitting out here somewhere. I spent most of yesterday chatting with Mr. Caston. He spent 45 years uh, in the Louisiana prison at Angola, Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary. He was sentenced as a juvenile, uh, and he was released in 2010 only because of the work of C.S. Sané and Brian Stevenson and Equal Justice Institute. 45 years yeah. of a person's life sentenced as a 17-year-old child. Uh, those, fortunately, those kinds of sentences are at least being reviewed, but many of them, many people are not as fortunate a as he. Mm -hmm. One thing I would say is an encouraging development with the death penalty, but uh, somewhat discouraging on the other side of it. Uh, in the 1990s, we sentenced as many as 315 people to death in a single year. Uh, last year, only 39. The year before that, 35. So there's been an incredible decrease uh, in the number of death sentences, and they're all being punished, uh, being inflicted in just a handful of counties in the country. Uh, we are actually, I don't know how close, but we're fairly close to the day when we'll finally make permanent, absolute, and unequivocal uh, the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Uh, but, but accompanying that has been the increase of life imprisonment without any possibility of parole, mm. which is a death sentence. It is a sentence that you will die in prison, that you have absolutely, you're 18 years old, and you're sentenced to life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. You're going to live the rest of your life. You may be a model citizen, 
You may be like Mr. Kasten, not have a single disciplinary report, but it doesn't matter, you're going to die in prison. And those cases are not getting, you know, so much of the resources is, of course, is going to be put into death cases and be getting people, keeping people like Mr. Hinton uh, from being executed for a crime we didn't do. But I will tell you, there are people in prison serving life without parole for crimes they didn't do, and they don't have lawyers. Uh, they don't have anybody who can come to their rescue. There's an increasing number of these extremely draconian sentences being imposed all over the country. Uh, and of course, here in Alabama, you can see it sort of even in the death cases. The last person executed was 83 years old. The person executed before that was 75 years old. They tried to execute Doyle Ham who was in his late 60s and suffering from cancer, but despite pricking him over and over and over again, they never could inject him with the lethal drugs to kill him. It used to be when a person went into an a, a execution chamber to be killed, they didn't come out. They came out uh, on a stretcher. They went to the uh, funeral home. We've had three people in the modern history of the death penalty uh, who have gone in to be executed and have come back out after the effort to execute, efforts to execute them have been unsuccessful. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have this great problem with these geriatric prisons and these very elderly prisoners who, of course, had bad food, not, not much exercise, not much sunshine, uh, who are increasingly growing old in our prisons. Uh, it's tragic for them. It's a great human rights violation. Uh, it's extraordinarily uh, expensive for the society. And you meet some of these people like I've talked about and you see what a waste this is to have these ex exceptionally uh, severe sentences uh, for people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, Ray, you talked about that conversation in the squad car, right? Mm -hmm. With the man who laid it out for you. Yes. Why you should expect conviction Conviction, conviction, conviction. Ninety-five percent of elected prosecutors in this country are white, right? And that's about 2,400 prosecutors. That's the, uh, is the elected numbers. Um, of those, of all those prosecutors, 79 percent of them are men. Only four percent of prosecutors are men of color, and only one percent of prosecutors are women of color. You just Talk to me a little bit about how that played out in a personal level and what kind of change we need to see on this front when we think about who holds so many life and death decisions in the palm of their hands. And sometimes it's a judge, but in many ways, those of you who know a lot about the system know that it is the prosecutor. Well, I, I personally think that it all started with money. Uh, the reason we don't have a lot of blacks uh, in judgeship or uh, running for office, they have made it too expensive. You have to have money to do campaign work. You know, in this country, it is a shame that in the state of Alabama, we are willing to pay our school teachers thirty-five to forty thousand dollars a year to teach our kids but yet we're willing to spend two million mm -hmm. to execute a man or a woman. I really find that profound disrespectful, disgraceful. And I, what I can't understand is that I often tell people, use your vote to get this system the way you want it. You know, most people, when I got, came out of prison, even my best friend thought I wanted a big old whopper. <laughs> and I didn't want a whopper. I wanted Mr. Stevenson to do two things for me if he never did anything else. I asked Mr. Stevenson, is it any way possible that he could arrange so I could tell my story to the whole world? And I said, Mr. Stevenson, is there's a way that you can get my voting rights restored. Mm. I say that 
And I haven't missed a vote yet. And I want to say that we will spend money on prison, but yet when we come to education, we want our kids brought up dumb and stupid. And that will keep them out of the legal system, but only will put them behind the bars and the wires in the prison. In my book, I wrote and I started a book club on death row. These are men that dropped out of school at eight and seventh grade. And to be honest with you, I said, what kind of, the hell, I would have dropped out if I could, but my mother wouldn't let me drop out. <laughs> Didn't the police come and make y'all go to school? Well, what I've learned, the system want them to be done. Mm. The system can find money for everything in this country. But they can't find money to pay our teachers. We can't build schools. You know. I often think about those men that I started this book club with, and I had read the book, Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. And I got six people, the only six, the warden would let me. And when they read the book, each one of them had a different view of the book. And I realized at that moment, society plays a part because no one ever took the time out to try to get them to learn. Mm. We are just a country that don't give a damn about nobody but ourselves. Mm. As long as it's not in my backyard, you know, I often say this and I'm gonna bring it up and I'm gonna tie it together. But you know, when the drugs was over on this side of the neighborhood, didn't nobody give a damn. But the moment, the moment the mayor and the moment the senators and their daughters and was getting hooked on it, all of a sudden, it's an epidemic. Well, it should have been an epidemic when it was over here. And if you had treated it as an epidemic over here, you wouldn't have had to worry about it coming over here. And so that's what we find out of in this system we have. It's never been needed a worse overhaul than it does now. Amen. We need, we need, and I'm not gonna always put it on the prosecution, the judges, we need good lawyers. We need lawyers to stop telling people to cop out. If, 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 if going to trial break the system, break the system then. But I, 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 I'm just against that we can find money to, to execute a man and we haven't made ourselves any better. But we're not willing to give that little girl at five and six a head start. I often think about, I'm gonna tell you uh, one more thing before time now. <laughs> that book, uh, The Sun Does Shine, that's a good book. Y'all go out there and read that book. Go get that book. But there's a man in my book I talk about, was a Klansman, Henry Hayes. Henry Hayes was not born with three Ks in front of his name. Henry Hayes was born Henry Francis Hayes, but his mother and father taught him to hate all his life. And I often ask, where was this village that we say it take a village to raise a child? What was child protective service when this young man was being taught to hate? Why they didn't go in there and get it? But we have a system that will arrest you for spanking your child, trying to teach him value. But this young boy was being mentally abused and nobody gave a damn. Mm. But then his father gave him an order to go out and kill the first black man that he came across. And he happened to come across a 19 year old black male. They hung him, they cut his genitals off. And this village, they came out 
and they found him guilty. And this village said this world would be better if you wasn't in it. But I looked when I got to know Hayes. I didn't put all that responsibility on Henry Hayes. I put it on a system that didn't give a damn about this little boy. If they had, they would have made sure that he was in an environment that he could get an education. He could have became something. But we just don't care. We allow the politician to give us a 30-second sound bite, and they grease in their pockets. And all of us is having to deal with a system that is nowhere near fair in us. We have a system that gives you a lawyer, and even Professor Wright will tell you, the law state, you just need a lawyer. You don't say you have to be woke. Mm -hmm. Doing the trial. And we need, to, we, need, we need to overhaul this system from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. We need to take our anger, not in the streets, not burning buildings. We need to take it straight to the pole. And just like we put on Doug Jones in office, we'll put some more in office. <laughs> That's what we need. talk just a little bit about the, the prospect and also the pitfalls of reform. More and more when I talk in public, I'm not talking about reform because, you know, mm. truthfully, we cannot tinker around the edges of this system, can we? Amen. We need transformation, not reform. So as an example, um, when we look at the juvenile criminal system in this country, the way that we hold children accountable, um, on the one, well, first and foremost, you need to know if you don't know already that black children are more than four times more likely to be put into prison than white children, right? Something totally unacceptable in and of its, in the first place. You need to know that uh, the juvenile justice system is in some ways an area where we have seen uh, progress because we have far fewer kids in juvenile prison today than we did 15 years ago, right? Between 20, 2003 and 2013, the juvenile prison population was reduced by 47% nationally, right? That's actually mm. great. We have far fewer kids locked up in juvie prison, though too, far too many kids are still being transferred into the adult system, right? But here's the other thing you need to know. During that same period of time of success at reducing that population, the racial disparities in the juvenile system increased by 15%, right? Mm -hmm. So that got worse. The racial, even as we succeeded at having fewer kids locked up in juvenile prison, and if I was, you know, uh, in charge, we would have zero juvenile prisons. There would be no prison for children. Um, we have to think about how reformation or transformation uh, is intentional and thoughtful and the fact that racial justice has to be central to those reforms because what we've seen transpire in that juvenile system reveals that okay, we're gonna get some progress in some respects, but who's gonna be left high and dry? Children of color and vastly disproportionately African-American children. So when you think about reforms that have that centrality around the question of racial justice, it's pretty hard to find them. I'm just mm. going to point that out to you. But I think about what's happened in Chicago. For those of you uh, who don't know some of the history around policing in Chicago, uh, there was a gentleman, a gentleman is a, is a stretch, there's a man named John Burge who was a police commander for many years in Chicago who ran a crew of police who tortured many, many, many black people and forced confessions and sent innocent people to prison and broke the law. And it took a long time to hold John Burge accountable. But one of the results of that quest for accountability by the community and by community organizers who worked long and hard was that not only, you know, John Burge was sent to prison for four and a half years, hmm. and he did get to keep his police pension. Hmm. However, there, was a, there has been created in Chicago a reparations fund for his victims, hmm. 
It's a $5.5 million reparations fund. Over $100 million public dollars were spent around, you know, sort of the violence, the police violence that he created. And as important as the reparations for those survivors of violence, also, this history will now be taught in the Chicago, Chicago public schools. Mm. When I think about why we're all here today, why we've gathered together, why we have been up to the mountain, and why we have been to the museum, um, and I think about Chicago, we need to see more of that, right? Thank you. We cannot prevent there ever being another situation like yours, Ray, or Ramona's, uh, without that truth and reconciliation process that we have seen in other countries and that, that Brian talks about so flawlessly, mm. you know? Um, so, gentlemen, I always like to leave folks with some hope, right? That's a, that sh story of Chicago is a tough story, but that's where we want to get. I wonder if there's some other examples. You know, Ray, your book, Against All Odds is such a beautifully hopeful book. Thank you. You know, uh, there are, it made me cry many, many times while I was reading it, but it also made me laugh many, many times, and I appreciated Thank that. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, Professor Bright, I'm curious, the areas that give you the most hope going forward. Well, I think this, I think we're, at least in some places, and I'm not sure it's for the right reasons, it's probably for the reasons of how much it costs to institutionalize people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever. Mm -hmm. We've been building our way out as we put more and more people in prison, building more and more prisons. It's not sustainable. And so finally, there's a look at why are all these people in prison and why are they there for so long? And we're at least beginning to look at addiction as a health problem and not as a criminal justice problem. And that we can deal. I mean, we are seeing places where the number of people in incarcerated is going down where prisons are being closed, nowhere near uh, fast enough to get rid of 2.2 million people uh, in prisons. Uh, but that's certainly one thing. Secondly, we have seen around the country, in Philadelphia maybe as Exhibit A on this, very progressive prosecutors have been elected who've adopted a, uh, uh, a, a, a more thoughtful uh, approach. Uh, I've always, of course, been a big advocate of the right to a lawyer. People accused of crimes, this is it, why anybody accused of a crime has got to be represented by a competent lawyer that knows what they're doing, who's client-oriented, and who's determined to do the absolute best and provide the most zealous representation. Hmm. We still are a long way to go in an awful lot of places, including most counties in Alabama, but there are places. Uh, in Georgia, for example, we have a capital, there is a capital defender office, which now people facing the death penalty are represented by lawyers who actually know what they're doing, <laughs> who have specialized in only representing people in death penalty cases. And we've gone a few years now without any death sentence. The same thing in Virginia, where there's an office now, people that specialize. So instead of just any lawyer being pulled off the you know, the, every kind of practice under the sun from title searches to divorces to death penalty cases, uh, we now have lawyers that actually uh, are trained, competent, have people that know how to investigate the cases, build up the penalty phase cases in mitigation. Uh, that's a huge change, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen the number of death sentences decline so dramatically mm -hmm. from over 300 in 1996 to 39 last year. Uh, if that number complete continues to go down, at some point it's just not worth the candle. Uh, but there's so many other aspects uh, of, of the criminal uh, courts where there's a need for competent representation and all the different specialized, we know that uh, many, many people have been wrongly convicted of arson, for example. It's very complicated to do an arson case, there's a lot of science there. And I won't go into it except to say if you've got people accused of that kind of crime, you've got to have people who know how to defend against that kind of crime. Uh, and so we're making some progress, but of course the biggest challenge is why would a government, whether it's federal, state, or local, most of it is state, by the way, 95% of the people in prison are in state uh, custody, uh, why would a state that wants to fine, imprison, or kill someone pay to defeat that very purpose by providing the person with a competent lawyer? Of course, the answer to that is the Constitution says that's what we have to do. Uh, but as Robert F. Kennedy said when he was Attorney General, 
Uh, the poor person accused of a crime has no lobby. Uh, and people of goodwill and people who care about justice have to be that lobby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am hopeful for the things that I've already witnessed in this state. There was a time we couldn't sit at the restaurant. There was a time we couldn't vote. Now we can vote. There was a time we couldn't go to your university. Now we can go to the university. Mm. All of those things took time and it took people to finally realize that we all are God children and enough is enough. And I am hopeful for the thing like the museum. That was a time I would never thought something like that would be built and especially created by someone like Mr. Stevens. And those are the things that make me hopeful of the things that we have already overcome. We got a long ways to go and every day we should wake up to strive to make not only our lives better, but someone else. And so I am very hopeful today. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I, we could talk all day, but uh, we are out of time. Thank you. Thank you.